Good evening. Uh, we welcome you to worship this evening. Hopefully you picked up a, a bulletin found in the, in the center of the aisle. You'll find the entire worship service this evening printed in your bulletin. And we begin with our call to worship. Please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, source of all goodness and life, who clothed us with Christ Jesus, and who makes us one by the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Let us pray. Dear good and gracious God, we pray that you help us to be bearers of your peace in this world. May we see the world as you see it, so that we can bring about justice and love in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
may be seated. Our reading tonight comes from Mark's Gospel, uh, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. And she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So Judas began to look for an opportunity to betray him. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Your good and gracious God, We pray that in times of difficulty that you help us to feel your presence with us, that you help us to be your disciples even in times when we fall short and and feel like we don't add up. We know that you don't cast us aside and that you love us. Please help us to remember that and to be able to share that with the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue to walk day by day, uh, through Jesus' last week, uh, using the book, The Last Week, uh, that you might have been following along with, uh, and using the Gospel of Mark uh, as a guide through that last week. It's the only Gospel that, that goes day by day through that last week. And so today we come to Wednesday, fitting, because today's Wednesday for us as well. But we're now closing in on the Passover festival, and people have come from all over the countryside to join in the festivities. Crowds are gathering from this countryside and and from the city. And and immediately in the text, we see that this is a problem for the scribes and the chief priests. Jesus has shown that he's already a thorn in the sides to to these groups of people, to these Jewish leaders with his teachings, with with all that he's accomplished in his ministry at this point. So by this point in the story, it's clear that they want him killed. They want to knock him off, get rid of him. He's becoming too big of a problem. And if for a moment you forget about the rest of the gospel and just look back on on the events that have already happened this week, you can see just from this week alone that it's clear why the chief priests and scribes would want to have Jesus killed. On Sunday, Jesus comes into town on this donkey providing a, a contrast to the military procession that's coming in from the other side of town. And he enters Jerusalem with the crowd shouting blessings to him about this coming kingdom of God. On Monday, Jesus cites the text from Jeremiah regarding the temple's symbolic destruction, 
And of course, after the chief priests and scribes hear this, they again want to put Jesus to death. Because the whole crowd is spellbound, the text tells us, by his teaching. On Tuesday, Jesus grills the chief priests regarding the killing of John the Baptist. And then he tells a parable that put the chief priests and scribes in a, in a really bad light. So by Wednesday, they're fed up with Jesus. And so they're looking for a way to arrest him and put him on trial so that he can ultimately be crucified. So that even though Jesus is preaching this nonviolent message, it was subversive to Roman law and order, and there was nothing that Romans found more important than law and order. But like I said, these pesky crowds made it difficult for the chief priests and scribes. They, they didn't want to make a public display because Jesus by this time had a lot of enthusiastic support. I mean, after all, on Monday he rode into town like a hero. They're not going to be able to arrest Jesus during the festival, and, and he's going to leave after this festival. So the only chance that they have is to try to figure out a way to get Jesus away from the crowd and to execute him before the crowd knows what is going on. But they get a break when Judas comes to them because obviously Judas knows Jesus' itinerary. He knows when Jesus will be around the crowds. He, he knows where Jesus is staying, and, and he knows when Jesus will be alone. Judas is the perfect remedy to these crowds that are causing these chief priests and scribes such difficulty. And even though Judas is the most famous example, one that's lifted up all of the time uh, during this time of year, uh, of a disciple falling short, he's far from the only disciple to get it wrong during Jesus' last week. And this is true even before they get into Jerusalem. Throughout the Gospel of Mark and, and the other Gospels, Jesus is on a journey that points towards Jerusalem. Everything he does leads up to the final week that we're walking through right now. And during that journey, Jesus tries to prepare the disciples for what will happen to him when he runs into this huge Roman Empire. Jesus speaks about this kingdom of God, this kingdom of God that stands in contrast to the earthly kingdoms like the Roman one that currently occupies them. And the disciples fail to catch this message time and time and time again throughout Mark's gospel. And so they're unprepared to deal with the Roman Empire when they arrive in Jerusalem, as we see by reading through the gospel text day by day. But even though the disciples are unprepared and, and unknowledgeable, there is someone who does get it. An unnamed woman arrives on the scene who anoints Jesus with an alabaster jar of expensive perfume. Just as Jesus stands in contrast to the powers of this world, this unnamed woman stands in contrast to the disciples who constantly get it wrong. All the disciples are constantly falling short, but this unnamed woman gets it. In fact, in the, in the book, the last week, they say that she is the first believer. She is, for us, the first Christian. She believed the word of Jesus before any discovery of an empty tomb. She knew that this would be the only opportunity to anoint Jesus because he was going to die and rise again. She knew the message that, that Jesus has been trying to tell his disciples the entire time, his, his know-nothing disciples who constantly don't get it. And apparently she wasn't even important enough to have her name recorded. But I think there's some irony in that because once again Jesus is contrasting God's kingdom. We're in God's kingdom, a, a nameless woman is able to anoint the very Son of God while those closest to Jesus wonder what is going on. This would have never happened in the Roman Empire or, or any other earthly kingdoms for that matter. So even though this text is, is certainly leading to betrayal by those closest to him, I think there's hope in the midst of the scripture. I think there's hope for the disciples, even for us, when we feel like know-nothing disciples. When when we, like the disciples, fall short of what Jesus is trying to tell us, when we have difficulty standing up to the powers of this world that stand in contrast to God, when we betray Jesus, we are not cast aside so that Jesus can find new disciples, just as Jesus didn't toss aside his original disciples for new models. And I think there's hope even for, for Judas, lifted up as the ultimate betrayer. There's been a lot written wondering why Judas would commit this act. 
but it seems like the Gospel of Mark is, is a lot more worried about Judas' identity instead of his motive. Every time Judas is mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, he is referred to as one of the twelve. Almost like it's a title, Judas, one of the twelve, as an indication that Judas is one of them. Even though he'll commit this act of betrayal, he is a disciple. He is one of the twelve that will fail Jesus dismally during the last week in Jerusalem. He's a traitor that's entered into an agreement with the powers of this world that rebel against God. It's like Mark is trying to say, yes, Judas gets it wrong. Yes, he gave in to the sinfulness of this world for whatever reason. But he is still a child of God. He's still a human being. He's, he's still a disciple of Jesus. He is still included in this group. So even in the final few days of Jesus' life, he's still turning the world upside down. And Mark emphasizes this upheaval that Jesus continued to present in his final week. A nameless woman who gets it right. Those closest to Jesus who get it wrong. Those with no power that are given power. And, and those with power being brought down. This is Jesus to the very end. And so I think I'd like to end with a prayer this evening. So please bow your heads and, and pray with me. Dear God, we thank you for not casting us aside when we don't get it right. We thank you for continuing to be present with us when it feels like we know nothing at all. But we know that as your disciples, you call us to be who we are and you meet us where we're at. Please help us to continue to feel your presence and to go out and share your love and your light and know that what we offer is enough. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't we stand and sing uh, our hymn, Lamb of God, it's ELW 336.
You may be seated for our special music.
led by Christ, in our journey of repentance, and moved by his compassion, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Pray that you guide us during the season of repentance and renewal. Help us take everything away that keeps us from loving relationships with Christ and with one another. Pray for those that we find hard to forgive or trust. Guide us towards forgiveness for our hate, temper, and ignorance. Oh God, hear us, hear our prayer. Pray for those who are sick or hurting, and for all the troubled situations in our world. We especially pray for Keith. Denise, Kimberly, Harlan, Donna, Bob, Jack, Greg, Carol, Bill, Mike, Madison, Laura, and the others we lift aloud. Pray for your eyes to see creation as Jesus did, for courage to walk in Jesus' path, and for the strength to carry Jesus' cross in this world. Mighty God, you have commanded us to pray, and you promise to hear it. Hear the prayers of your people and grant all us that we need. For the sake of the one in whose name we pray, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our sending hymn this week is um, ELW 881. 881.
in peace, serve God humbly.